Hello, this is part one of my interview with film critic Corey Coleman. Hello, welcome to Paul Best. Today I'm honored to have this guest. He's been an animator and has a credit in the movie Space Jam. He has had his own public television show in Texas, hosting The Real Deal, then going to spill.com, which many people of the early internet may remember for its animated movie reviews. Now he currently resides in Austin, Texas, and the main host of The Devil's Hosted, with multiple different podcast shows that include The Sunday Service, What Up Sun, The Weekly Roast and Toast, the movie review extravaganza, eight big crumbs, and the daily shovel talk. These shows cover a variety of topics, including current events, pop culture, movie reviews, and video games. My guest is Mr. Corey Coleman. So, what's up, Corey? How you doing? I'm doing great, man. How are you? Can you hear me okay? I'm doing all right. Anyway, so just gonna ask you some questions, and we're trying to get some insight about you know your podcast, and you know, but also you as a person, as an artist. Yeah, whatever you need, man. So my first question is, so what was it like growing up in Waco, Texas? For me personally, it was mm-hmm. cool. Uh, you know, I grew up two-parent household, pretty pretty normal. Uh, mm-hmm. Had some very supportive parents. Uh, you know, as with anything, nothing's perfect. But as far as my family life, that, went, that was fine. As far as the city goes, uh, you could tell it was a little conservative to the point of self-segregating. But... You know, I went. I was one of the first generations to go to a integrated elementary school. So, uh, you know, it could have been worse. But you know, I pretty much had a, I had a good upbringing, had a good childhood, a lot of good memories. Nothing, nothing too traumatizing. I think that's a good way to put it. So, how did growing up kind of inspire the work you do today? Uh, well, I think that there are a lot of things that inspired me to do what I do. Uh, you know, before I started doing any of the, you know, podcasting or broadcasting stuff, I was into animation and my sister would always sit down and draw with me. My big sister, who's like 10 years older than me, she would always sit down and draw with me. And uh, that was like my first passion, learning how to draw and then animation right after that. But I think there was something about loving movies and watching a lot of movies that really wanted made me want to learn uh everything about it including the performing side of it the acting side of it and I always admired movies where they had charismatic or very uh, entertaining characters and I always wanted to kind of be like that in a way so I think that that is what led to the performing side of what I do that's interesting it's it's interesting you say that cuz I also grew up with like a brother who was 10 years older than me did he influence what you do? Uh, yeah, I would say that as well. And, you know, I think he got me into, like, nerdy stuff because he was into nerdy stuff. But I don't yeah. think we're the same. And, certain, like, he uh, he always was, like, playing music and stuff. And I'm not, I've never been, like, musically talented or anything. Ah, uh, but you got, but you got, you didn't, get into the, you didn't get into the music stuff, but you got into the nerd stuff. <laughs> Look, I think it was also because... Uh, I was forced to like play. If he got a board game, I would be forced to play it with him. He got this thing. I would be, you know, I would have to come along with him to the store or whatever. <laughs> so you have no interest in music at all? Uh, no, I like I like music. It's just to play it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, I, so what, you want to get into filmmaking? Yeah, but you know, I think also in just like the broad spectrum of filmmaking, like kind of like what you guys do in a sense, where it's not. Well, you guys are a production, but it's not like just we're making a movie, but you're making something kind of new media. I'm still yeah. kind of unsure, but yeah, yeah. something. That... I hear what you're saying. That's, that's, mm-hmm. that's just always appealed to me about doing this stuff. It's always changing. It's always new. It's always something that in technology moves so fast that today is like, you know, there's always something. It's, it's To me, it's always fun to discover something new. That's a new technology that helps advance what you mm-hmm. do. So, yeah, I see so so your love of drawing and then you kind of uh i mean after i guess education stuff you go into animation like you start working into animation can you talk about that a little bit yeah i was in college and there was an animation studio that opened up in austin and 
from what I knew at the time, there wasn't really any straightforward animation companies in town, you know, that our studios, it was mostly like gaming stuff at the time. So that was really cool that there was something local. And I also wanted to be an animator. Uh, you know, I was lucky enough and I was always, I'm always grateful that they hired me. Uh, it definitely was a big boost to where I am now, but you know, I, I didn't really have any animation samples to show, but I was, you know, it was cool that I had, a, I had a sketchbook. No, it was cool that, uh, that they hired me based on a sketchbook I had. I, everywhere I went, I, would, I was always drawing, I was always sketching, and I had a, just a sketchbook full of stuff. And you know, it was cool of them to just hire me based on what they thought was decent draftsmanship. And I worked in uh, that, I worked at that studio for about three years. And before I realized like, you know, animation's just really not my thing. And that's kind of crazy after growing up, wanting to do animation all my life. You know, I always thought that that was the dream job for me. And when I finally got it, I was, I was like, ah, you know, I'm not, I'm not too crazy about it being done this way. And if I'm not crazy about it, I'm not, I'm not going to be that good at it. And so I was kind of considering getting out of animation until Adobe Flash, which I guess you're familiar with. It's, it's a different name now, but Flash animation, you know, that's a, that, that's, that became a category of its own, but I, you know, I, working digitally just kind of turned me around to it because working traditionally in animation is such is you know is such a time consuming and such a large group effort you know and i and it's, it's for me i'm i'm i don't know maybe it's ego or something but or maybe i, I am somewhat of a control freak but just being feel, feeling like i'm just being lost in the in the mix of it and i'm doing all this hard work and no one possibly knowing my name or what i did on it just didn't seem to really appeal to me. So I wanted to get into something where I had more control. People would know my name is on it. Maybe I could do more stuff on it. I could get it done faster. Digital really turned me around on animation. So can I ask, I think uh, there's been a lot of discussion on your show of, of Looney Tunes. So uh, <laughs> particularly you, your love of it. But so can you talk about working on Space Jam or at least drawing the Tweety Bird shadow? <laughs> Well, you know, that's just become a big joke. I mean, the reason why that's a big joke is because, like I said, I wasn't the best artist at that studio. And I, and I know that. I, like I said, I always appreciate the opportunity, but I wasn't the best artist that they had. And so I wasn't always put on the best projects. And, you know, it's me and this other guy. We were always kind of the ones to be put onto something last or put onto something out of desperation. And So kind of bottom of the totem pole? Yeah, pretty much, man. Which I'm not complaining about. It's not any hostility in that at all. I totally understand where they're coming from. But there was a, the studio that I worked for, the one I was telling you about, they were called Heart of Texas Productions. And the way animation works is, you know, you'll have a studio like Warner Brothers or Disney or somebody working on something. And then, at least back then, uh, if they really, really, really need to, they'll farm out work to smaller studios for maybe some things that aren't you know, the, the, the biggest stuff to work on. So I know that Space Jam, our Warner Brothers for Space Jam, they sent over a lot of, uh, a lot of side stuff to do at the studio. Like, uh, you know, I can, I don't want to get too technical, but uh, they, they did this, like what they call like not, not the main animation, but like in between. Like shadows animation. and like. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, also, well, when you're doing a, when you're doing animation, you have what they call, uh, you know, you have your animators that do, the main animation and it's not all mm -hmm. done all at once what they do is they draw like the real extreme or key poses for the animation you know just the highlights of that of the animation they'll give it to another person to fill in in between so you know they gave stuff here like to the studio stuff that might be for assistant artists or clean up stuff like the sketches need to be cleaned up they gave you know they gave us that and yes uh, effects animation including shadows a lot of shadows that need to be done on stuff so one day they, uh, you know, they had a lot of stuff to do, and I guess somebody has just said, "Hey, you know what? Just I, I don't have time to do this. Just do this shadow on this on this Tweety Bird uh, frame right here. It's Tweety Bird on an iron lung." So they, and I guess they would think, you know, it's a shadow. How hard can this kid mess this up here? So uh, I get it. I do the shadow. It's quick. I do it in probably like about I don't know, fifteen, twenty minutes or something, and. And that's my biggest contribution to space jam. <laughs> the big, the funny thing is, is that because of that one shadow, because I did something on Space Jam, they had to put my name in the credits. 
<laughs> you can see my name in the credits, but the name doesn't come up until like much later in the movie, like near the end of the credits. But the studio, they you know they they feature every studio. Mm -hmm. uh, so our studio came up, and when the, when you see our studio, because my last name is Coleman, uh, it just somehow my name positioned in a way where your eyes just go to it first. So I think the joke is you had all these people who worked on Space Jam. They did a whole lot of work, way more work than I did, and then my name is above them over there. So, you know, uh, yeah. Everybody looked at it and they're just kind of like, damn it, Corey. You know? I worked hard on this and you do one shadow and my name is over mine just because of the alphabet. You know? Oh, that's good. So were there any other like unknown projects that people didn't know you work on or is there some stuff you can't you can't say? No, nah, I you know, this this stuff that I worked on when I the, the company that I worked on afterwards, it was a gaming company, but they they did mostly educational games. It wasn't like, you know, EA or something like that. So, so like Leapfrog and stuff. Kind yeah, of? yeah, exactly. Yeah. Le in fact, I think uh, Leapfrog was one of the first projects that I worked on over there. It was Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Man, uh, it was a frog named CJ. And it, it was a children's game, and this frog was teaching like math through fairy tales or something. But there was a, I probably talked about this on the show, you probably heard it. I, there was a, there was a, a Wild Thornberries game. Wild Thornberries, Wild Thornberries meet up. No, it was a Wild Thornberries, Wild Thornberries game, you know, from Nickelodeon. Hmm. So I did, I was the lead animator on that, a project lead on that. Um, You'll never hear of. You can look it up online and find it, but you know it's from '95 or something or '96. It's the when the game was released it was on floppy disk. Also, I did something called Redbeard's Pirate Quest, which was cool because you have all these interactive games now. You know, and you have all these uh, interactive peripherals. You know, like when the Wii came out, you had the, you know, you had the sensor controlled, um, you know, games that they had. Uh, so <laughs> that game I worked on that was one of the first interactive games of that type that was like one of the first technologies out there were doing that and uh i was a lead animator on that they had a commercial for it and everything uh again something that you won't hear about if, unless you look it up but if you look it up uh you know you don't see my name anywhere on the commercials or anything like that but i was i was a b the big project in an animation lead on that so hmm, oh interesting so how does uh you go from i guess animation to your public access show well, like I said, I've always had a, a lot of interest in just the creative stuff, man, especially creative stuff with performing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I've always loved movies because of that. And there was a guy that I was working at the animation studio with that also loved movies. And we talk about movies all the time. We started going to movies together because we just, you know, we're talking about movies so much. And we saw so many movies together that it was a guy named Ian, Ian Prickrell. And Ian was, uh, he just came in, he said one day, he's like, man, you know, they got this cable access thing. We, we should try to do that. We should do that on a radio show. And I said, well, let's do the cable access show because that's a visual thing. So we went and took the classes because that's what, and for people who don't know what cable access is, that's what, that's where you have a, every city that has a you know a, a cable provider those cable providers are required to they were i don't know if it's still this way but they were required to for major cities to have a couple of channels for uh the community that meant the community would come in and do uh you know they would produce their own shows and i think it was always under the under the the, the idea that people would produce these these shows that would serve the community some kind of way, tell you what's going on in the city. But it just ended up being crazy people going in there <laughs> doing stuff. Uh, it was, it, you know, people going in there and just, just doing wacky things. Crazy, like and people who are actually, you know, conspiracy theory people, like Alex Jones, he did a show right before I did. All right. Yeah, Alex Jones was, uh, you know, that's how I know Alex Jones, because I would, he would finish his show and we, had, we shared the same studio. And he would be in there before I would. And we'd talk and everything when he was done with his show. So, um, but anyway, uh, we went down there and did that. And we, that's, and once it was done, we did the, we, we, we were able to get like, uh, 
movie clips and passes from the studios. We just had to pr- prove that we did a show. So um, yeah, we we did we did a couple of sample shows. They gave us passes for the movies. They let they, they told us that we were officially pressed, and uh, we just did it for fun because we wanted to go. We wanted the free movies, you know. And that's all we wanted, man. We didn't care about. We didn't really care about the show as much as like, man, we just want to go see movies for free. But once I started doing it, I was like, man, you know, I like doing this. This is what I was thinking about. You know, I'm not producing the show. I'm in front of the camera. I'm actually being able to perform, even though I'm talking about movies. And so it got pretty popular after a while because we did it for so many years. I did it with him. I did it by myself for several years after he was gone. I uh, started bringing in more people. And then when I saw that it was picking up uh, and how many perks it was giving us, uh, throughout the city you know people were inviting us to parties and we were getting rewarded for things and i was getting to travel out of town to go see movie screenings and premieres and you know eating on their dime once all that was happening i was kind of like well yeah i'm in man you know this is this is cool so how does the public kind of uh, the cable access show go over to spill we were doing that show for years, man. Our, you know, at least I did it for years. I did it for 10 years. And at one point I decided, like, after 10 years, it's like, man, this is cool. But I kind of have this mentality of, you know, after a while, and one, I just kind of just want to do something different. And I thought, all right, you know what? The, things were changing at the time. YouTube was coming in. Uh, did You know, uh, uh, the internet was changing the whole way people uh would consume stuff and that and the way they were consuming entertainment was our videos was kind of like the way they watched uh cable access so i saw cable access as being kind of overshadowed and pretty much being pushed in almost non-existence by the internet and so i decided like one i've done this for 10 years i'm gonna just it's just time to stop two I want to get into more internet stuff because unlike access television, it reaches people around the world where access television was just reaching people in the city. Um, and we, when I stopped, I started animating our stuff. Cause I just, you know, like I said, I got an animation background. I want to animate something. Um, and I started animating our reviews. I would make cartoon characters out of all of us. Took old reviews that I had started putting that, uh, started, started putting that on the internet. And then, there was a company in New York that, that saw it, this company called Miva, and they wanted to get, they, they had nothing to do with entertainment, but they saw the internet and thought like, hey, we want to get, we want to put viral stuff up, or we want to get into entertainment because this stuff like is, is blowing up. And so Miva contacted me and said that, you know, are you the one that does animation? Are you the one that's the idea man behind this? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And they, they, they hired me to develop the idea for them. So, uh, yeah, I got hired by them, went out to London, talked to the, one of the guys out there, and you know, uh, and that's where he came up with the name Spill. Spill was uh, owned by uh, a, a oil company that went out of business. <laughs> it, it, was a, it, was, it was for oil spills. They made equipment for oil spills. And when they, when they went out of business, because we were looking for a name for the site, and uh, the, the, the guy who was, it was a guy in London who looked like James Bond, man, in a way. And he... Uh, and he he was a real smooth guy. And he just said, you know what? You know, we're gonna sp- I like this name Spill. What do you think about it? I'm willing to spend sixty thousand dollars on this because this company went out of business. And we spent sixty thousand dollars on that name Spill. And and that's how the name Spill came about, and that's how the whole project came about. So then Spill ends, and now you're currently doing double toasted for the past couple of years. So how does it feel kind of owning your business compared to like working for a company? Uh, great. <laughs> it's much, much better because, you know, uh, with, with something like this, it's, it's, uh, you, you, I, when I work, when I was working for Spill, uh, when we were doing Spill, uh, we were handed through so many different companies and, or at least a couple of companies and, you know, and, and it was good. It got everything off the ground. It got, it helped get me some recognition. It got me to travel. Like I always say, I'm grateful for that experience. I have nothing bad to say about the people that that owned us. I will say that, you know, just logistically, it just makes sense to do it this way. You know, we were doing something that, you know, I was doing a lot. I was doing all the work and somebody else was putting in the money. But when you get right down to it, this is something that doesn't need to be owned by somebody else. You know, I'm the one that's calling the shots and doing everything. So it's like I put in all the hard work. All the money comes back to the company that I created. and I also have uh, 
I don't have to I don't have to wait for decisions to be made or have decisions handed down to me that I don't want to do. Uh, you know, there were so many things that needed to be done with spill and those things just kind of those decisions and processes were slowed down just because there was so many approval levels that you have to go through. And that's not what we have here. You know, I see something need to be, that needs to be done. I do it and I take care of it. And that's it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, owning your own business is also a lot of work because you have administration, administrative stuff you have to do. You have, you know, you have to take care of your finances, taxes and all that kind of stuff. It gets expensive. But, you know, if if it's making money and you're doing OK, um, it's complicated, it's hard. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's so much better. Did you, and to that point, did you feel constrained in what you could say when you worked for a company compared to now? No, nah, you know, it was a cool thing about the company that we worked for, man. They they didn't, creatively, they didn't really hold us back. You know, the only thing is they might have asked for us to do more stuff that I thought, than I thought was necessary or wasn't wise to do at the time. But for the most part, they never censored us. They never came in and told us what to do. They never, you know, as far as, you know, uh, uh, the, the, how we ran our podcast or, you know, the videos that we made. They were very cool about that. So now you're doing Devil. So you're doing Devil Toaster. So I've always wanted to know, why did you let people into the studio? I, I've never heard of, a, I feel like most podcasts always like, either they do like live show and that's how they'll bring people in. But for, you know, when you, and this is pre-COVID times, you would just let people, anyone, as long as they emailed you, just let people come in and watch the show. Yeah, because I think that, one of the things that I, you know, like I can't speak for everybody that does what they do, but you know, for <laughs> us, I always thought that the interactive side is what really made us successful. You know, and I, I always made it a, a point to go out and try to be as open and inviting to people as I could, because that's community building. When you start <laughs> building a community, you know, that you're, when you start doing something like this, it's not, you, you don't, you shouldn't concentrate on just building an audience. You should concentrate on building a community. And I always thought the strongest way to build a community is to to make it feel like it was open and accessible and everybody, you know, and creating an atmosphere where people starting to start not to only know us, but other people that might be in our community. And so, you know, inviting people in when they were in town was just something I thought was cool. You know, I just we had a space. Um, and also it goes back to that performing thing. Like like I said, man, I love performing in front of people and um, having people in the studio, I think gave me the idea like all right you know i'm feeding off of people's reactions you know it's um you know having people come in it was kind of give, giving us a, at least giving giving me a boost as far as uh the excitement level of doing what we do so you know that's why i had people in the studio no it was in, it's interesting i i've just i never thought of it about about it like that so i guess also to that point when you sort of made double toasted or kind of got away did you how, how did you kind of come up with the idea of double toasted like after you left spill like the idea of like mr toasty and the sort of just <laughs> brand itself uh the well i knew that i was going to do something after we left spill i was like i got to figure out something to do and I, you know it's what it goes back to what i was telling you about new technology i because i always <laughs> saw some stuff coming up and that's one of the things i think i was ho- held back on is like you know, I want to get into streaming now because I saw streaming coming up. And I said, streaming is going to be the way to do this stuff, man. And subscriptions is going to be something that's going to be the next level. So I didn't, I wasn't content with doing uh, just videos for YouTube anymore. Plus, a YouTube channel was messed up when I was spill. <laughs> so I was like, I couldn't wait to start something on our own. On our own. And so uh, the idea for streaming something came up first. That was the, you know, because also was, you know, we were doing animation before and I said, you know, animation was taking so long. I I think we had a flawed business model on spill. Animation was taking so long to do and I don't think the returns were worth it. Uh, So I thought doing live action and streaming was going to be cool. So after we, after decided to do that and I thought this is the future right here, then I started thinking of a name, you know, I was like, and I, I was trying to go by the spill thing. It's like, I don't want to name something movie this or entertainment guys or anything like that. I'm kind of the person that figures like, hey, just find a weird name and have people just say the name. Even, you know, the the weirder the name is or the more pulled away it is from what you're doing, the more it's probably going to like pull people in 
you know, uh, uh, unless you think of a very clever name, that's kind of obvious to what you're doing. So I don't, I don't know. My, I forgot what it said. My wife made a joke about. I think she made a joke about me and. Uh, and, and uh, it's okay, this is gonna sound more racist than what it is and it's not. But she made a joke about me and two other black people and said something like triple roasted or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, and it made me laugh enough to where I said, you know what, maybe I should use that as a name. But then triple roasted sounded like a coffee place. So I just thought double toasted. I don't, you know, I, I don't know why. I just the name just said something to me. So and then we thought that I it was weird and I just it just had a ring to it. It just stuck with me. And then, of course, when I thought double toasted and finally applied for the name, I thought, uh, you know what, uh, what would be a cool logo or a mascot or something? And, you know, a piece of toast with a smiley face on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. And, and Mr. Toasty, yeah. Mm -hmm. So kind of akin to what you were speaking about earlier, uh, something I think that's always been interesting about, I think even before in Spill and, and now is kind of your movie rating system. The fact you just don't do uh, one, you just don't do stars or you don't do like, you you kind of give it like a I'm trying to think a word to to rate it like you give it like you give it a rental you give it some old bullshit you give a you know better than sex or a full price how did how did that where did that come from uh that is something i thought of when we did uh when we did it was me and another guy another guy named cisco we thought of this rating system together uh when we were doing it we were doing a a, a um we were doing a show for a news affiliate. It was a 30 minute, it was a 30 minute live action show that we did on Saturdays. It was called Behind the Screens. And it was myself, Martin, and, a, and another girl named Jenna. And when we were doing that, yeah, I just I was just thinking of, of a rating system with uh with this guy Cisco, and I that, that's how it came up. Um mm -hmm. we didn't have uh I don't think we had, but since it was a news channel, it was, you know, we couldn't be too dirty or anything, or we couldn't be, you know, we couldn't use foul words. I don't know if we use, I don't know if we use bullshit at the time. I know full price rental, uh, full price matinee rental, and maybe we said some BS or something. I don't know. I don't know what we used for that one. Uh, or maybe we said skip it. I think when we started doing, um, we started doing spill and I pulled it over there. That's when I started like getting edgier with the ratings. I was like, yeah, we can cut now we can cut loose and call this some old bullshit or hmm. give us a fuck you or something. So that's where that yeah, that's where that uh that's where that came from. We we were doing that that show for that news channel. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting to hear. Uh, because I feel like a one star like you can say something's one star or this thing's good, but like you say something's a rental, it's like, oh, I, I know what you mean. It's universal, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's universal. It's also, you know, again, thinking of something, you just just think of something that stands out, you know, something that's obvious might be cool, like full price and matinee and whatnot. It's relatable. People can grasp onto it real quick. I'm surprised nobody had used it before. Uh, and then, you know, give people something a little to remember. Like, we give something some old bullshit, you know, that's something that make people laugh, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> it's something that people can remember. It's good branding. So, yeah. So I guess kind of something you've kind of talked about and I want to ask, so how do you, fa so uh, with current Double Toasted, how do you find like adapting new technology like Twitch and Patreon to Double Toasted? Like, how have you find that? Usually they find us at some point, like, like we were, we were approached by Twitch and, and Patreon. Like Patreon, they go out and talk to a lot of creators. It wasn't like, I don't want to make it sound, sound like we were that special or anything. Like if they see that you're, you got potential for something they they actively because that's their business they actively go out and they seek creators that they find their channels or whatever and then they say hey why don't you try patreon they pull you in you talk to them during a you know uh uh you know you talk to a to a to, to a, a rep that they hired on the phone or through a video chat and you, you see if it's for you and i thought you know this is something that we should probably try you you see how your business is going and you try to see if you can adapt and use these things for yourself and i thought you know uh we had our own. Here's the thing: we had our own site, we had our own platform, we had our own subscri uh, uh, subscription model. You know, we had our own pay system set up. Um, technology has gotten to the point today where you know every they have so many services now and platforms that are made for convenience. That I thought, all right, I'm doing this all on my own, but maybe it'd be cool if I let somebody else handle that it has more features. It's the same thing with our site. You know, our site was cool, and we all and we still keep our site doubletoasted.com because. 
in case something happens, we always have a platform that we can go to. You know, if we if I if I let's just say we get canceled on Twitch, um, we can always go to our own platform and start over somehow over there, or at least you know have some place to go that people can go to. But the thing with Twitch, Twitch, you know, had been trying to get us to come onto the platform for a couple of years, and you know, it was just to a point where it was like, all right, uh, you try to figure out how you can take the old stuff that you have from your site doubletoaster.com and try to you know so you're not abandoning that and you're not leaving customers or, or people who have subscribed to that out in the cold uh you know it took me a long time to figure out how i'm gonna like migrate these people over to twitch if i want to go to twitch because the reason why we went to twitch is uh twitch had the i mean look they got the eyeballs they got the audience you know they got a whole you know did we we just had to, i had to like weigh the pros and cons and they just had way more people for us to be exposed to you know it was a big was a, it was a better marketing thing for us uh, you know and they and also they were able to help us out with certain things they were able to do a, a push for us and get us you know get us out there and seen by people that we hadn't had before so you know it's, it that made sense to go to twitch uh once we figured out technically how to like move our audience over without leaving them out in the cold so does it does that make sense well that makes sense you kind of wanted to uh bring in your old people but you also wanted to see use twitch to get new fans correct right yeah i mean this, yeah we like when you're doing this stuff on your own you know it's slow growth but you get to keep 100 percent of your profits you're in more control uh twitch was a little intimidating because they could ban you at any time if they, you do something they don't like uh you're always under somebody else's control right there but at the same time you know the the uh, 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 the the opportunity to grow is probably faster. The opportunity to pick up new fans and grow your business is probably faster. So that was something that we want to do. And they've been very helpful. Like I said, you talk to somebody every week who helps you out. They they give you pushes for certain things. They if you have you know if you're one of the people that's doing well, they they they'll fund certain projects for you. So it's been good, man. Thank you for checking out part one of my interview with Corey Coleman, and part two will be out soon. I want to thank Corey for coming out to the show. Please check out Devil Toasted on Twitch and Patreon. If you like their content, give them a sub. I also want to thank Ananda Smooth for creating the music and Anna Tachinko for designing the art. Please check out the show on Instagram and Twitter at CallbacksPod. And I will see you next time on Callback. Callback.